thank you for joining us. Um, this is going to be a really fun discussion because you're going to get to hear from three students who participated in the Legal Rights Center Fellowship Program. And they got to talk to community members about the Derek Chauvin trial. Uh, so we'll get to that in a moment. I have a couple of housekeeping items to uh, let you know about. Today's webinar is being recorded and a link to the event will be shared via email to all of you who registered for this event. We do have live auto captioning enabled and you just need to click on live transcript, uh, the feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to view or hide these captions throughout today's discussion. Finally, we will reserve time at the end of this discussion for a Q&A or to answer questions. You can submit questions by writing them in the Q&A part of the, it's at the bottom of your Zoom, uh, in the screen. So please, if you have a question, write it in there. Um, and if we have time, we'll ask the students to answer your questions. Now I wanna turn it over to Sarah Davis, who is the executive director of the Minnesota Legal Rights Center. She is also the first woman to be executive director of Legal Rights Center. Sarah. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you uh, to the University of Minnesota for having me here today um, for this exciting panel discussion. Um, my name is Sarah Davis. I am the executive director at the Legal Rights Center. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the LRC, we are a community nonprofit law firm located in Minneapolis. We are in our 51st year this year. We were founded in 1970. Uh, and we were founded by the American Indian and African American communities coming together um, who saying we need a community owned law firm um, and later welcomed immigrant communities to their coalition. And we continue to be led as we were founded by a coalition of BIPOC communities. Um, we do a variety of work um, within the community. We provide free legal defense for children and adults who otherwise could not afford an attorney on criminal charges. We engage in restorative practices um, in schools, um, family group conferencing to support young people who are at a critical juncture with their ed education, whether they've been referred for expulsion or suspension, facing potential court charging um, on criminal matters or uh, truancy matters. We engage in restorative practices to support kids to stay in school um, and support schools to be a welcoming environment for young people. Um, and then we also engage in a variety of advocacy, which you're gonna hear more about today um, through our community strategy team, community legal education and policy advocacy focused on system transformation. I'm thrilled to be here today, thrilled to talk with you about the fellowship that Micah, Emmanuel, and Tony participated in. Just a little bit of an overview of that fellowship and why it was created. It was um, a brand new opportunity that was created in partnership with the University of Minnesota Law School. Um, back at the beginning of 2021, um, our our organization was really committed to developing um, a community trial support plan in response to community identified needs for support leading up to and during the Chauvin trial and the trial of his three co-defendants. And to do this, we were really focused on three major areas. One, the first one being community education on trial proceedings, second being restorative processing of the trials, and the third being protecting our community during the uprisings and protests. Um, and as we looked at trying to meet these community identified needs, we realized we needed support. We're a small legal nonprofit in Minneapolis. We all have um, full-time jobs doing things like representing folks charged criminally, restore, uh, facilitating restorative conferences. We have staff who were really committed to this work, but also who already were very, very busy doing the ongoing work of our organization. And so in, in dialogue with the University of Minnesota about how uh, the law school could support this effort, the idea for this fellowship was developed. Um, and so the law school funded the fellowship to allow us to bring on in the spring and in the summer um, fellows to support the, the areas that I've just talked through. So things like supporting community forums and live ask an attorney session. Um, you'll hear more about this from the fellows themselves, but 
those those community forums and live ask an attorney sessions ended up being viewed over 24,000 times. Um, we did trial, we created trial education videos and trial education resources for community that have been viewed over 4,400 times. Created a restorative toolkit to support processing of the trials, helping folks understand what was happening and creating space for folks to talk about um, how they were feeling about it, discuss the trauma related to the trial, and talk about um, what processing needed to happen for community and what changes could happen. That was downloaded over 450 times. And then, you know, providing real time legal support. So, supporting the Twin Cities Legal Support Line, a 24 hour legal support hotline that we help we helped, uh, support and staff, jail visits. Uh, legal representation, and then critically um, on the ground, know, you, know your rights trainings at protests, train the trainer models. Um, all of this work would not have been possible without Micah, Emmanuel, and Tony. And so I'm really excited to introduce you to them and to uh, give them an opportunity to talk about their experience. Um, so just for brief introductions, Micah is a 2L at the University of Minnesota with an interest in tribal and neuro law. She clerked with us during the Chauvin trial and is still uh, clerking with us now. She's very interested in community engagement and organization and brings strong background in that. Um, she wants to stay rooted in Minneapolis and continue activism as an indigenous attorney after law school. She's not wearing a blazer today, but she usually wears some great ones. Um, Emmanuel Williams is currently a 2L at the University of Minnesota Law School. Um, he has a deep passion for criminal justice reform and believes that every voice can and should be heard. He spent his undergraduate career at Carleton, Carleton College, has a BA in political science. Um, he became involved with the Legal Rights Center because of his unrelenting commitment to racial equity and community-led political change. He was work he's uh, spent time working and is still working with us on our legal team and our community education and outreach program. And finally, uh, Tony is a current dual degree student at the University of Minnesota Law School and Humphrey School of Public Affairs. He's pursuing a dual JD MPP degree. He clerked with us over the spring and the summer, creating infographics about the Chauvin trial and general trial processes, and also assisted our legal team. And I know Mary's a professor at the law school and probably needs no introduction here, um, but former chief public defender in Hennepin County um, and current candidate for Hennepin County attorney. Um, and we were really lucky to have Mary join us on our community forums um, throughout the Chauvin trial. So I hope that she'll also jump in and share her perspective. Okay, let's have uh, Emmanuel. Do you wanna talk about your experience first? Yeah, I can. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, first and foremost, I'd like to just thank the Legal Rights Center for the amazing opportunity and the continued opportunities to make an impact in the community. But um, I guess for me, this opportunity meant a lot because it gave me the opportunity to uh, bridge the gap between the legal community that I was uh, becoming a part of throughout my first year and over the summer and the Minneapolis, you know, community that I have kind of flung myself into um, spending the last kind of five years in the state of Minnesota and the last year and a half just living in uh, Minneapolis. Um, so I feel like my big role in the work I was doing at the LRC is a part of the Know Your Rights program, um, which was us uh, providing trainings, uh, train the trainer sessions to fellow law students, um, attorneys, as well as teens and uh, activist teens in the community, giving them the uh, ability to uh, give uh, information to the public about their First Amendment rights surrounding around protests, how to enforce those First Amendment rights when at a protest, but most importantly, how to keep safe um, and the safety of you, your family members and friends when dealing with law enforcement at protests. Um, we spent numerous hours uh, giving these presentations as well as you know, gathering people, um, being out on the streets, being on the ground at these protests, not only after the murder of George Floyd, but also um, in the uh, continuing efforts that we have to get justice throughout Minneapolis with uh, the murder of Dante Wright. Um, so being there um, downtown in Minneapolis with these 
these protests uh, in Brooklyn uh, Center with these protests, it really helped kind of give me an idea of what I wanted to continue to do with my legal career and as I move forward in the legal field. Um, as I can see kind of the bridge between the knowledge that I'm learning here at the University of Minnesota's Law School and how to apply that not only in the courtroom, but also how to apply that to the general life that, you know, the average lay person is living because not every person is going to uh, be impacted strictly by an attorney in the courtroom, but being impacted by an attorney on the street, helping protect their rights as they uh, amplify their voice is something that's very important as well. So I, I suspect a lot of students who are watching this want to know, how did you learn how to do those things? You've, you've talked about being in the community and helping educate the community, but, but who taught you? How did you learn about First Amendment rights and that sort of thing? And, and, and Tony and Micah can also jump in here as well. But Emmanuel, could you start telling us that, please? Yeah, absolutely. I had the amazing privilege of learn, uh, working under one of the attorneys there, um, Chelsea, who kind of gave me the initial tools to begin to learn around, you know, the, the First Amendment rights that I was going to be presenting and learning that information. Um, going through the presentations and the information that we had researching up on it, um, using a lot of the skills that I learned uh, over my first year at the law school to prepare myself for these presentations. But I wouldn't be remiss in saying that, you know, a lot of my learning actually occurred, you know, during the presentations while I was on the streets with these protesters, because uh, as anyone will tell you that is a been a part of the legal system or study any part of the legal system, there's not a whole lot of black and white, but there is a lot of gray within the legal system. So you have to be able to figure out, you know, how those specific facts fit for specific people. Um, you know, uh, a story that I continually tell in a lot of my protests now, uh, protest presentations now is that, you know, I had someone when I was telling them, you know, how to invoke their Fifth Amendment right to silence in an attorney, um, ask me, you know, what do I do if I'm having an asthma attack? I suffer heavily from asthma, you know. Um, I I've never interacted with law enforcement before. I, I feel like I might start to hyperventilate. I might start to freak out about that situation. And that's something that, you know, I really took to heart. And I, I thought, well, what would that person do? And after, you know, uh, kind of talking with Chelsea, going through a lot of research, you know, finding that, you know, they are obligated to that, that medical help, you know, they, they need that medical help. And just because they ask for that help and receive that help, it doesn't mean that they have, you know, revoked that right. Um, so to continuously bring that right up and, you know, continue to voice that you are remaining silent and that you want an attorney, you know, different things like that really help to uh, educate myself on the First Amendment rights uh, of people and how they apply in these various situations that we've seen over the last two years. Thank you for sharing that story. Micah, could you talk about your experience? I would love to. Um, yeah, so I started clerking with LRC um, a little before the Chauvin trial and then continuing now, so it was throughout the summer as well. Um, I looked to the LRC specifically because I was really drawn to how it was um, community organizers first and also attorneys. So they, they center their community and first and foremost, their community members. Um, I had a lot of organizing experience in undergrad and just throughout life. Um, Anti-racism and social justice is just like a component of who I am and how I act every day. So it was important that I found a place that also shared those values. Um, so what I thought was really valuable and really realistic for what I could give while I was in law school is being able to sort of translate this really difficult um, legal language into something that's digestible and presentable for the community and also provide a space for them to be able to process that and kind of go through how that affects not only what they're watching with the trial, but how that affects their communities and their day to day interactions with police and, you know, with other members of their community. So that was really important. Um, and I'm really grateful to be able to have opportunities with the LRC staff and the attorneys to, to be very, very um, 
they were really invested in our journey as, as attorneys or becoming attorneys and as being involved in the community. I really appreciate the, um, the support and sort of the, the patience with learning some of these really intense concepts. I remember researching like the, the sentencing guidelines and being like, well, this is just doesn't end. Um, so they were really patient with that and also just really um, interactive with what we were doing. So that was a lot of the, uh, during the spring and during the summer, um, I worked a lot in community outreach with um, a teaching series where we um, opened up this space for community members to discuss and sort of lead discussions on um, various legal topics that we thought would be important both as a reflection of the Chauvin trial and the upcoming trials like the Potter trial and whatnot. Um, and we brought in other community organizations to talk and to sort of work through even concepts as um, abstract as abolition, um, going through these really difficult things to be able to sort of see where the community is at and actually kind of gain an understanding of like what their concept is of the legal world because you know that as Emmanuel said earlier with that you know we're sort of bridging the gap between those two. Um, so it's a lot of the work that I have done. Micah, can you think of a particular person that you interacted with or can you tell us a story that really uh, sticks with you to today? Sure. Um, I think one of the really important parts was actually uh, being at George Floyd Square. Um, Emmanuel and I had been handing out some Know Your Rights brochures and someone had come up to me and sort of just seemed um, suspicious that there was a law firm out there that was genuinely trying to be present for, um, for the people and provide support in a way that didn't have some sort of underlying goal um, that the law firm was actually just, no, 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 we're here for you. Um, and I sort of had to reflect on that and think about why that was sort of like a revolutionary concept. Um, and that just kind of made me feel more, um, more tied to the work that we're doing at the LRC. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, can you tell us about your experience? Yeah, so I came here last year uh, on May 31st, um, you know, a, a bit after the, the protests had happened and I participated a lot in, you know, community cleanup as well as, you know, public food drives that were going on on Hollywood Boulevard and everything. And through my experience in that, I, I knew that during my time in law school, I, I sort of wanted to continue that work. And then the opportunity to work with the Legal Rights Center uh, came and I was super excited. One thing that I really wanted to do was with my past work in communications, I sort of wanted to combine that with, you know, my current legal education and alongside Micah, uh, sort of create and disseminate information in a more digestible manner. I worked on a lot on creating infographics that we posted on our social media pages. And, you know, I, I thought that it was really important that, you know, not everyone, you know, responds well to just plain black and white text. And sometimes, you know, making things more approachable um, can get people more interested in what's going on in their community and especially, you know, what's going on with the Chauvin trial. Um, that was my work that I, you know, mainly did throughout the spring. And as summer approached, I worked under a uh, defense attorney, his name was Hirsch. He was absolutely fantastic, uh, extremely knowledgeable within his field. Um, he had worked with the previous public defender's office um, for a while. So it was really great to, you know, see how he approached uh, trials, how he approached clients, and really kind of got that wisdom on, you know, that I hope to continue in my legal career. You know, I, I did see some of your graphics and they were just outstanding. Um, so they helped me understand things as well. Can you tell the audience uh, a little, some specifics about the graphics? When you say you did some graphics, what what kind and, and how did that help people understand? Or what parts of what was going on did that help people understand? Yeah, well, I, I've had family that have gone through the criminal justice system. And one big thing that I wanted to do was I, I spoke with them about, you know, what they knew was going on, what questions they had, and then kind of tried to steer those in, infographics to address those questions, you know. Um, and I, you know, I, I really tried to add like blurbs. It was very much like, you know, a screen sized infographic where you know, it, questions of like what kind of witnesses were, you know, a part of the trial or what it meant to be an expert witness and, you know, really, you know, why that person was qualified to answer these questions. Um, and so addressing it in that manner really helped me, I feel, make it as digestible as possible. 
I think you're on mute, Mary, but I was going to jump in just really quick to say that, um, you know, I really appreciate all three of you going through to talk about what your experience has been like, you know, it just brings me back um, to when when we sort of jumped into this in the spring and, and continued through the summer. Um, when we when we um, worked with the University of Minnesota Law School to develop this fellowship, um, we engaged in the hiring, we posted the position and we had no idea who would be interested in joining us to do this because we'd really, we knew we were going to be building the building the fellowship while we were in the midst of a really um, difficult time for our community and really needing to build while we were also doing the work. And we had a lot of really, really well qualified applicants and it was a difficult um, process for us to make a choice. Um, and ultimately, you know, we were originally only going to have two fellows, and we ultimately decided to move forward with three because um, Emmanuel, Micah, and Tony each bring incredible lived experience, family experience, and you know, backgrounds that can uh, that allowed them to jump right into the work. So Tony's experience doing communications work, just for example, right, in terms of being able to create infographics um, and to translate some of that, you know, intensive legal. Um, knowledge into something that was digestible, digestible by community. Um, Micah and Emmanuel both bringing, you know, community organizing and community connections and, you know, and how are we going to be on the ground at Know Your Rights workshops? How are we going to, um, you know, create forums that welcome young people into this space to get um, questions answered? And so, um, we were we feel incredibly incredibly lucky to have found Micah Emmanuel and Tony to come to our team um, and for the experience that they all brought. So I just can't say enough how how great it has been on our end as well. So what what kinds of experiences did you have with community members who were talking about their perception of the trial? What did you learn about about the community and the community's perception of the legal system? system. And anybody can jump in here. In here. Uh, yeah, I think my biggest takeaway from a lot of the conversations that I had with the community members about, you know, their perception of the trial, their perception of the legal system um, was one that, you know, there is a lot of legalese and, and legal definitions that, you know, people don't necessarily understand. And I don't think we are necessarily going out of our way to bridge that understanding, um, you know, to help people understand when they are dealing with the legal system, whether they're watching it from the outside or are actually just within that legal system, um, helping them understand, you know, the processes that go through, that we go through, the processes that they are going to go through, and what different results necessarily mean. Um, and two is really just the kind of because of that lack of understanding, the kind of distrust that a lot of community members have uh, with the legal system, and that expands even further than just necessarily, you know, um, law enforcement agencies and, and police departments. But, you know, as Michael mentioned, you know, people being out there from a law firm handing out information with no underlying goal was a revolutionary idea to a lot of people that were at uh, George Floyd Square and um, at these protests that were organized throughout Minneapolis um, and the metropolitan areas because they never thought that anyone in the legal system was even on equal playing field. Um, I think, you know, something that can't be ignored that I applaud the Legal Rights Center for doing is that, you know, they brought in law clerks that are people of color. And that's another aspect that a lot of people never really understood, you know, seeing a uh, uh, people of color, women, um, and other minority groups in the legal field helps kind of also just bridge that gap with the community um, that I feel like a lot of community members never um, envisioned being what they would uh, see out of a law firm, you know, that is out there um, doing as me and Chelsea kind of came up with was uh, movement lawyering, you know, uh, lawyers that are out there helping the people in the community around them. Can you or anybody else say more about why representation is so important? So when you're out in the community, why is it important for community members to see uh, lawyers or students of color out there as well? Yeah, um, 
I personally feel like it's important just from some of the interactions that I had, you know, with people out and about, they feel like you're more and more approachable, you know, they're not uh, as afraid of, you know, coming and asking you the questions that in their mind might seem silly to an attorney. Um, but asking those questions so that they can be under explained and they can understand it uh, as a, a basic lay person would want to understand the legal system. Um, along with that is just, you know, the approach that when people who are in a system that kind of look like you, you can envision them having similar experiences that you're going through, you know. Um, I was approached by someone whose brother was arrested uh, the night before in a protest and they came up to me and they were like, you know, uh, you, you know how I could feel, you know, you, you have sisters, you have brothers. And I'm like, yeah, I do understand exactly how you could feel. Um, you know, the fear that you can feel being, you know, a person of color moving through the legal system. So I think those things are very important um, for, you know, not only the legal field to pay attention to, but also for um, the educational side of law schools, you know, looking for students of color. I can imagine that that would be hard in some ways as well. Um, Tony or Micah, can you talk about what it was like um, experiencing the feelings that you had while you were trying to help community process their feelings? I, I mean, I had a really big sense of hope for the community. Going to George Floyd Square, it was very prevalent that you know they weren't just trying to hold space but they were trying to make something out of it they were trying to grow you know they were trying to learn about you know everything going on with the Chauvin trial they had you know a, a book center where you know they were giving away free books every person that we approached was so willing to hear about the situation and kind of tying back to you know being approachable and you know not showing up in suits showing up in you know our legal rights sweaters or you know just like regular clothes and kind of like not approaching it from a high point, but approaching it on equal ground and just seeing how, you know, everyone was so willing to learn and so willing to, you know, just do what, you know, the most they could with their space and, and to really try to grow. Thank you. Micah? Yeah, um, this kind of ties back into um, the experiences that I had uh, noticed and sort of saw with the community discussing the trial and sort of the legal system in general is that there is a sense of distrust. And what I really appreciated about the conversations that I was having is that we were able to just kind of flat out discuss why there is distrust in the legal system, why there is um, a foundation of racism that the legal system was built off of and how that perpetuates and how that affects communities in a way that, you know, there was some pessimism and there was a lot of frustration and there was a lot of valid anger. And the LRC, like the spaces that we created, allowed people to actually just say that without this weird, you know, you're not, you're not supposed to say that it's a legal injustice system. You're not supposed to say these sort of these unsaid things. And we were allowed to process that and talk about that. And, you know, people, almost every person I talked to had some family member or friend that was incarcerated or had a, an experience with the police or with some sort of agency. And it was really important for me to be able to, to see that and to also kind of reflect on my own role as an attorney and also in the community. Um, I think one of the reasons it's important to have um, BIPOC clerks and just in general is that that's there's less of an opera there's less of a chance that we're coming in from with a savior complex and we're coming in from an equitable grounds of we are the community and we're also building with them we're not coming in to build a resume and 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 do this and then leave this was very much like we are on the ground with you and we are at every step of the way micah would you mind saying a little bit more about what you mean by a savior complex yeah um i think especially with opportunities to work in communities, um, there are, there's, there's this savior complex where people go in thinking that they are going to save or give something to the community that's not already there. Um, our community in Minneapolis has all of the love and the care and all of the organization that it needs. Um, and maybe some of the things is just the legal language to work through that. So it's not like we gave anything that they didn't already have. We just translated some of the stuff for them. Thank you. Um, how did your perceptions of the criminal legal system change, if they did, uh, after going through this process? 
any of you can jump in. I don't know if I would say that it did change. I think that, you know, at least personally with my experience, I've had close family members go through the criminal justice system, um, and uh, which was kind of another reason why I joined the Legal Rights Center. I've kind of seen where the legal system has failed and where it can improve upon. And that was sort of the work that I'm pretty sure all of us wanted to do was to improve the legal system, improve the sort of translations that you know, are most of the time not given to community members and, you know, sort of, you know, attempt to make an improvement. Emmanuel? Yeah, I, I would have to agree with Tony. I, I don't think my perceptions necessarily changed all that much about the, the criminal justice system. Um, I think when I came in, I uh, had an understanding um, that, you know, a lot of times in the criminal justice system, there are two kind of systems that we're dealing with. One that, you know, uh, really harpers down on a lot of the racial foundation that it was built upon. And another that is, you know, there to help rehabilitate certain individuals. Um, and I feel like the work that we did at the LRC um, actually helped to give people space to, you know, not only voice their opinion about the criminal justice system, but also to give them space to kind of treat a lot of the trauma that comes out of the criminal justice system when people go through it. Um, you know, with our just restorative justice programs and a lot of the, the information and education that we provided. Micah, how about you? Yeah, um, I echo both what Tony and Emmanuel are saying. I think um, I will add that coming in, the criminal justice system seemed sort of like this strange conceptual being that I didn't, I was sort of a, I'm a, I'm a firm pessimist in life. So I was just a pessimist about it in general. Um, and I think what this did was allowed me to see this, you know, this firm that is saying, okay, there's this giant structure and it's unfair and there's a lot of things wrong with it. And while the idea of total transformational change is, this, is really great, we can't do that right away. So here's what we can do and here's how we can help our community. And so that really allowed me to see okay, so there are people doing really incredible things. This is how they're doing them. And they, these little moments that we have worked on, that they're working on every day, they do actually make a big difference. And talking to the community members whose you know, cases they've taken or all of these other parts where we've affected them, it, that's where I am able to see, okay, so there is you know, these day-to-day -day actions and or these small things that do actually have like a linear change. Sarah, uh, do you wanna to respond to that question as well? Yeah, I'll just jump in to say I really mostly want to build off of something that Micah referenced in her prior answer about, um, you know, not, you know, not coming to community with a savior complex, right? And there's, um, at, at LRC, we are, uh, we're founded as and continue to be in community as a tool of community self-empowerment. Um, and there's, um, a distinction there between being a charity, right, where outside folks are coming in and saying we need to give this to, um, community is lacking and therefore we need to give this to community and bring our, our strength and expertise to community versus being a tool of community self-empowerment. And I think that's what you're hearing um, from, from Micah and from, from all of the student panelists, which is, um, it, it's fundamentally critical to for anybody who's who's joining our work at LRC, whether as a staff member or as an intern, to understand that um, our communities are strong, right? And we're 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 looking to build on strength and to to um, act as a tool that, as I've mentioned, a tool of community self empowerment. Um, in in the sense of yes, we we really do want to support. You know, to get to your last question, I think what you're starting to hear is, of course, at LRC, we, we support fundamental transformation of the criminal legal system. Um, the system operates exactly as it was designed to in terms of, you know, um, oppressing and harming black and brown bodies and communities, right? Um, so we, of course, support fundamental transformation. And at the same time, there's a lot of people who are being deeply harmed and there's things that we can do, right? And that's what I, I think what you're hearing folks say is we, we're taking that both and approach and we're doing it from a sense of a place where community 
community is a same, uh, is a place of strength, right? Um, we might need to, you know, there might be some financial resources that are needed to help us um, elevate that, right? But that community has a ton of strength if we can reckon, if we can bring, um, start from that place. You know, it was interesting. So, so the three of you talked about how you really weren't surprised uh, that much by what you saw and you were fairly familiar with the system. And I'm thinking that you probably encountered people who were not. Um, who were surprised by what they saw on the video about what happened to George Floyd and just kind of unaware of a lot of the issues that you've probably been aware of most of your lives. Um, did you have experiences like that? And, and how did you interact then? And, and this is a question for any of you. Manuel, I know you're nodding in your head, so I'll just call on you. Yeah, no, I, uh, you know, in a lot of the, the times that I spent out on the streets um, teaching um, these presentations about Know Your Rights, being a part of these teach-ins, there were people who, you know, they had gone through life and seen the legal system work in a just way their entire lives. So seeing what happened with the murder of George Floyd um, and the continuous murders of, you know, black and brown bodies, um, they were very surprised. Um, and they were also surprised to hear in a lot of these teach-ins, people talk about experiences that just seemed every day to them, um, you know? And I think dealing with that in a productive way was something that the restorative justice circles, um, teach-ins and the forums did very effectively. Um, they- Emmanuel, Emmanuel, can I jump in? And you might have just been about to do that, but. Tell us more about that. How did that work? Yeah, no, they provided spaces for people who had never seen injustices in the legal system and people who have been the victim of those injustices and giving them space in the same place to express their emotion, um, express the trauma that they're dealing with, um, and but also give you know explanations, um, legal explanations along with just, you know, personal antidotes that really opened a lot of people's eyes. You know, it's easy to see these things on social media, on the news and say, you know, these injustices are terrible, but it doesn't have the same impact that you might sense when, you know, the person that you pass every day in the grocery store has been a victim of these injustices. And giving the, the Legal Rights Center gave the community that space to really build upon you know, showing that, you know, these aren't that far away. And as a community, if we begin to bridge the gaps and understand one another, we really can, you know, start to change a lot of the injustices that we see. And I think that was the most important thing that I kind of saw when dealing with a lot of that. I'm gonna ask you, actually, this can be part of that, but I'm gonna ask you all, what uh, are some of the highlights that you walk away uh, with from your fellowship experience? Micah, do you want to start with that? Yeah, um, well, it's half true because I'm still I'm still in it. But um, I think one of the things is the amount of community members that I've talked to in different organizations and just have grown so much as a community member myself. I've lived in Minneapolis for nine years and you know I intend to stay here. And um, there's also just so much I didn't know about with different communities, like the Communities United, the Communities United Against Police Brutality. There's a list of other organizations that I didn't even know were doing all of these incredible things. And with this, with this fellowship, I'm constantly learning about all of this work that's already being done or has been, you know, worked on. And it's just kind of like more of a testament to, you know, the the tools of self empowerment in the community. Tony. Yeah, I'd say. One of the biggest things that I, I realized, you know, as, as technology and, and things, you know, become more prevalent in all communities, how beneficial, at least in the Minneapolis area, Mike and I both, you know, reached out to multiple Instagram accounts and looked at, you know, Facebook pages of just communities and, and community members having, you know, an outreach to hold this kind of space for people to, to allow community members to talk about everything that Emmanuel had mentioned previously. And, you know, just how willing the community members are. There, there's a whole Instagram pages of where to go, you know, in Minneapolis this weekend. And, you know, they'll make new posts of, you know, protests that are going on or, or you know, issues that have arisen in the community. And just 
how impactful that those pages have been and, and have given us the chance to, you know, be a part of these spaces as well. Yeah, Micah, you mentioned that you are doing ongoing work and Emmanuel, you are too. Um, and I know that one of the things that you're trying to do is to center the voices of people who are impacted. Can, can you talk about that, Emmanuel? Maybe you could start. Yeah, um, right now me and Micah are a part of a, a project where we are collecting the voices of people who have been impacted by the system. Um, whether that's, you know, have been incarcerated or have just gone through the legal system, um, been charged, arrested, but uh, collecting their voices, you know, so that we can, you know, show that once again, this is something that is happening in your community and it's impacting your community, um, giving them the opportunity to voice what changes they would like to see, what policy changes that we can bring forth, you know, upcoming in the future that really could impact the communities around us. Um, I know that, you know, I've sat down with a, a few individuals who have really, you know, opened up and told their story without much remorse. And it's been a very, you know, uh, promising and rewarding experience, but very emotional as well, because you sit down and really see, you know, the trauma that can occur in the legal system and you get to see, you know, how strong the community has to be to be able to continue to move on, you know, after experiencing this trauma. Micah, could you also talk about your experience with that project and, and also tell us, so you're, you're collecting the stories of those who are impacted. What are you doing with them? Yeah, so um, this story collection will serve as sort of an interactive map that will kind of show experiences of Minneapolis and St. Paul community as it relates to different policies in the legal system. And sort of one of the really important parts of this project is to nail down those very life-changing moments where a certain policy allowed for someone's life to be completely altered and have you know their course you know, completely be shifted. Um, and we wanna highlight those, um, ideally to turn those into potential policy change. Um, potentially I think next summer is the timeline for that. Um, yeah. So I, I think that the main point is that with, you know, policy change that comes from the experiences of people and that's where it needs to, like it needs to start with how it actually impacts people versus sort of an abstract concept. And then that's how we kind of move forward with it. So we're going to trans, uh, actually what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to ask Sarah, you to weigh in and maybe answer, uh, help answer the question of what is going to be done with those stories. Um, and then we're going to transition into questions from uh, the audience. Sarah? For sure. Um, yeah, we're really grateful to have Micah and Man Emmanuel still on board with us um, working on this um, reimagining the justice system project that is really focused on centering the voices of impacted individuals. And as Micah said, ultimately what we're doing here is building a map of the criminal legal system that is grounded in the stories and the voices of people who have been most impacted by it. And what we're doing is partnering um, across all the programs within the organization to collect stories, but then to partner community advocates and community members with attorneys on our team who can translate the harms that are being um, experienced into practical policy changes that, that are tied to whether it's a statute or a court rule or just a practice that's happening by a system um, stakeholder. And so the goal of this project um, is to build this map that's grounded in impacted people's experiences and that is tied to very specific um, opportunities for change. Thank you. We're gonna transition into some questions asked by the audience in the, the Q and A. Um, how, if at all, did this experience affect what you want to do in the future as a lawyer? Tommy? Yes. Yeah, jump in. Yeah, so um, what's been great about this whole experience and you know the reason why I, I sort of, uh, I, you know, I'm not, continuing my work there this uh, fall is I've started my degree in my master's in public policy. And one thing that this experience has really taught me, you know, the Legal Rights Center does work with policy advocacy as well. And I think sort of taking, you know, the things that I've learned throughout the spring and summer and, 
you know, implementing it as, you know, making my focus more so as, you know, an MPP student with a JD background and, and really trying to impact policy and, you know, specifically legal policy, either through the ACLU or other organizations, um, but sort of wanting to continue my work in policy to impact communities as a whole. I think, you know, with um, becoming an attorney, you are able to help, you know, 1% at a time and, and, you know, change that person's world and that is fantastic. But my, my end goal and hope is to, you know, make lasting, you know, policy changes. Thank you. Micah? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that's been really important for me to see is sort of where activism and working in the legal field come together. Um, and that's something that has definitely changed and has altered my perception of what's even possible. Um, as I said earlier, I'm a pessimist. So I sort of thought that, you know, there's kind of one way and you're in court and you're, you know, fighting these long battles and that's not true at all. There's been so many opportunities where we've been able to incorporate different skills and experiences and creative solutions to sort of touch on the legal system and work with um, people who've been wronged in community in a way that I just didn't think existed before. Um, so moving forward, this has just allowed me to have an open mindset into what is actually possible. Um, and that's been kind of like the biggest reward of all is just thinking, oh, wait, there's actually this other way of thinking I haven't even considered. Has that made you slightly less pessimistic? Yeah, like 24% less pessimistic. Emmanuel, how about you? Yeah, I'd have to echo everything Micah has said. Um, I think <clears throat> coming in, I knew I wanted to be in criminal defense. Um, but I always visioned it just making the changes that I can in a courtroom. Um, but knowing that, you know, activism and being an attorney don't have to be separate things. Um, and you can, you know, bridge those gaps really is a rewarding experience that I brought out from, from this, uh, this internship. So I'm, I'm really excited to kind of go forward and, you know, see what the future holds both as, maybe attorney Emmanuel and activist Emmanuel. So. This is a good follow-up question to that one. The problems can seem overwhelming for someone looking to make a difference in making things better in the local community, particularly a law student. Where do you suggest starting? Tony? Yeah, I mean, you know, reaching out to organizations like the Legal Rights Center, you know, volunteers are always, you know, supported and wanted and you know reaching out to your community like i mentioned previously with you know the instagram pages that post you know where to be in minneapolis this weekend and especially being a law student it's hard to sort of have that free time but on the weekend you know it's kind of visiting these communities speaking with the uh, community organizers who set those spaces up and seeing you know how you can help them directly if you know if they're looking for that is a great place to start Emmanuel or Michael? Yeah, I think this would be a great time to plug that we're gonna be having another train the trainer session for uh, law students coming up that the Legal Rights Center has on October 21st. It'll be around Thursday afternoon. Um, so that would be a great time to plug that. But I echo what Tony says. I think it's just, you know, getting out into your community, finding um, those organizations that you know, are trying to make change and understanding that, you know, you can find time in between, you know, being a law student and, you know, learning the, the legal land field um, while also being a part of the community and helping. Micah? Yeah, um, there's not much. I mean, yeah, the biggest thing is that um, I think when particularly, you know, a law student comes in with this idea that I want to change the world and I want to do all these really good things and the world is really big and there's a lot of things wrong. It can seem really overwhelming. Um, so I would just, yeah, start with local community organizations that have existed and are already doing things and have structures set up and it makes it a lot easier to join one and, and you know, work from there. Um, and I'd say also there's this, some, you know, sometimes there's an, this idea that if you go into sort of public interest that you might like that might be the field that you're stuck in, but this could also just be like part of your lifestyle that you are like finding, you know, ways and, you know, time out of your just normal life outside of professional life to just be involved in the community and see where that takes you. 
Sarah, do you have thoughts about how people can get involved? I do. Well, first, uh, thanks, Emmanuel, for plugging the, the train the trainer um, training that we have coming up. Um, so yes, I think getting involved with your community is, is really um, a tangible way to have an impact, you know, whether it's volunteering as a, you know, a trainer on the ground um, for Know Your Rights, um, you know, volunteering. Uh, there's times where we have to get the legal support line up and running again. You know, there's some the upcoming trial for Kim Potter, um, I believe starts November 30th. And then for the other three officers in the murder of George Floyd is scheduled to start in March, at least the state trial. Um, we anticipate that there will continue to be protests and uprisings happening in our community. And I think we are doing what we can to be prepared to be able to staff a 24 hour legal support line to get folks out on the ground to, to share know your rights. Um, the one thing that I would maybe add that's um, maybe slightly different is to, um, you know, to think about how are you educating yourself, right, on our community and how are you educating yourself on the strengths of our communities and the resiliency of our BIPOC communities here. Um, the law profession is overwhelmingly white. And so, you know, um, I think for a lot of folks, myself included as a, as a white person in this space, it's really important to step back and think about what are the things that we've learned um, that are um, actually untrue and really harmful about BIPOC communities and about the history of our communities here and how can we educate ourselves and um, come to the, find ways to challenge our own assumptions um, and really think about how can we come to the, to these spaces in a way that recognizes the, um, the need for community self-empowerment and not for folks to come in as um, saviors into these spaces. And I think that's a really important thing for folks to be thinking about as well. So I'm going to go around and ask for everybody's final thoughts. But before I do that, Sarah, could you tell uh, students how they can get involved in this fellowship program or Legal Rights Center in general? Sure. Well, the fellowship um, was brand new and, um, you know, we've, we've had, we always have had in law clerks and interns at the Legal Rights Center and volunteers, but this very specific fellowship was brand new and um, something that we would love to continue, although we have to, to engage in some dialogue around what that looks like. Um, if, if folks are interested in joining us as law clerks or volunteers, um, I would just encourage you to reach out. Um, the person who had been overseeing that program just recently got appointed as a judge. So right now, I guess that would be me. Um, but we are, um, you know, we're always interested in hearing from folks and we take um, law clerks over the summer through MJF and, um, you know, just really thinking about connecting with us to get engaged. And we hope to be able to continue this type of opportunity in the future. So. Um, I don't know, Mary, if you're going to also come back to me on final thoughts. Otherwise, I could just do that quick now, if that would feel timely. Uh, I, I am going to come back. Okay. To, but rather I can wait. I'll wait. That's okay. fine. Go okay. Ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, so we just want to hear what your final thoughts are um, about the program, about your experience, about the trial, the verdict, anything you want to talk about. What are your final thoughts? Tony? Yeah, so final thoughts are the fellowship was an absolutely amazing thing to be a part of. The Legal Rights Center is, you know, they truly are, you know, made of the community and are for the community. And I, you know, urge anyone that is, you know, interested to apply, to reach out, to be a volunteer, to be a part of, you know, the Train the Trainer uh, event going on. And, you know, I think that my work there was apps inspiring and I, you know, strongly encourage anyone to be a part of it as well. Thank you, Micah. Um, yeah, I guess final words. Um, I am so grateful to be part of the LRC. I'm having the absolute best time and I encourage anyone who's interested in this kind of work to um, be prepared to be uncomfortable in um, facing a lot of the really difficult discussions and the difficult things that you run into. Um, yeah, and I would also just like to say that one of the big things with 
this kind of work and um, particularly like during the, the Chauvin trial, it was really um, draining and it was really difficult and it was really emotional. Um, but one of the things that the LRC was really good at is creating spaces for us, like the staff in particular, to be able to debrief and talk about that and, and work through that um, because this work is not, is not doable without that kind of support. Uh, and that's a great point. Thanks for, for talking about that. Emmanuel, what are your thoughts? Yeah, <clears throat> my last thoughts are, are just that I have had an incredible experience with the Legal Rights Center. Um, they're going to have to kick me out the building before I leave because I'm, I've enjoyed it so much. But um, really and truly moving forward, um, I, I've enjoyed this work. I think if you have any desire to you know, make a change in the community, whether it's uh, near or far, um, feel free to do it, you know, take that leap, um, join organizations, be the vehicle of change that you want to see. Um, as Micah said, be prepared to be uncomfortable, um, but change has to come. Um, we have to solve a lot of these injustices and, um, and kind of a phrase that I've heard a lot at a lot of these protests, even after the trial, is that, you know, there was a minor victory, um, but we need to continue to go um, and forward with having more injustice solved and have more victories just like we did in that trial. Thank you. Sarah, back to you. Um, I just, you know, I can't say enough about the work that Micah, uh, Tony and Emmanuel did with us in the spring and the summer and that uh, Mike and Emmanuel are continuing to do with us this fall. Um, we probably just won't let you out of the building. We'll just uh, keep, we'll keep you there. So. Um, it has been transformative. Um, you know, when I talked earlier about the statistics about like the numbers of people, we've reached tens of thousands of people um, through the work that, that y'all have been able to support. And it just simply would not be possible without the work that, that you all put in. And I also just wanted to acknowledge the law school, right? Um, you know, we were um, looking for folks to support our community trial support plan and um, you know, for the law school to come to the table with this creative idea around we'll, we'll fund some fellowships for you to be able to um, increase your capacity to do this work was uh, truly transformative and we are forever grateful. I am deeply grateful. So thank you. Um, after hearing about this program, I'm excited about it. Um, I wish I had had an opportunity to experience something like this in law school. So um, I congratulate Legal Rights Center, the law school, and all of you um, for doing such a great job. Um, this, we're, we're nearing the end of our time here. I want to thank uh, the three participants or the students here, Emmanuel, Tony, and Micah. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Sarah, uh, thank you for taking time under your busy schedule to be here to, to talk about the program. And thank you to all of the students who joined us. I'm sure if you want additional information about the fellowship, that's available at the law school and through Sarah. Thank you very much and, and have a great rest of your day.